The rain, drumming on the roof of the ground car, became a rattle as the vehicle drew to a cautious halt at the curbside. The driver glanced over her shoulder and gave him a curious look. Sir, are you sure you want me to stop here? The weather today is... Good for my circulation, he rumbled. Open the door. She nodded at the heavy marble columns of the entrance a short distance up the road. I could park outside, Lord Chancellor. You'll be soaked through if you walk. The use of the title made him smile a little. He hadn't been that for years. Not since this girl had been a child, at least. But he appreciated that she said it. It showed respect on her part, something he was seeing less and less. He pulled his greatcoat tighter. You're new, aren't you? The driver nodded. Yes, sir. Assigned to your detail this cycle. What's your name? Mirin, sir. Agent Jasta Mirin. It's an honour to be serving you. Ah, she was one of those. If he concentrated, he could sense it, the ghost of thoughts at the edge of her mind. She'd read the books about the war, seen the hollow plays, even that terribly melodramatic biography from a few summers back. The poor lass thought she was doing something important here, watching over a faded old warrior. He wanted to tell her that she ought to request a different posting, something that would stand her a better chance of advancement in the security service. But he had met her kind before, and he did not have the cruelty in him to shatter her illusions. The truth was, the protection detail was only there as a holdover from his former high office, a part of his pension from a grateful government. It wasn't that he doubted he had enemies, he had once said that the calibre of his foes was the very measure of his character. But there was a discreet laser pistol holstered at his waist, in the same place it had been for decades, and he was still confident enough in his own abilities to defend himself. The girl relented, seeing the firmness in his eyes, and released the maglock. The car's gull-wing door hissed open, letting the damp and cold reach inside. I'll be across the street if you need me, Your Lordship. He stepped out into the downpour and threw a weary smile back at her. You don't need to call me that. My name is Karlendorf. These days, only Karlendorf. Most people walked with their heads down, hunched forward against the driving rain, eyes to the slick pavements. Karlendorf turned up the coat's thick collar and met it in the face taking some strange delight in the chill reality of it. He walked briskly across the court of cenotaphs, the heavy grey marble of the great museum rising up beyond the orchard of obelisks. The rain gave everything a sheen, a polished freshness that was at odds with the weight of history that pressed down upon all the monuments. He caught a glimpse of the war memorial, the flanks of pale blue stone reaching toward the low, dull clouds. The names picked out along its sides glittered in black and gold, spiralling around up and up. Clustered at the base, the tiny robot guides waited like patient birds. No one was calling on their services now, but on less inclement days visitors could ask them questions, or have them drift along the length of the memorial and highlight any name you would care to have them find. He didn't need their help. He knew where to look to find Susan Mendes, Albie Brook, and all the others. His own name was on there too, somewhere. One day it would be inked in with black over the gold lettering marking those who were gone. And there were countless names like that, dark among the glimmer of the living. He left the plaza behind, mounting the steps, feeling the pressure in his knees already. His body was a good machine, finely tuned and still running well, but it was old, and Karlendorf seemed to feel it more each day. He hadn't been a young man when the war began, and even though his kind were long-lived, it seemed like time was bearing down upon him. He wasn't as spry as he once was, and his other, more ephemeral talents were gradually fading with disuse. Just touching the girl's thoughts in the car had been taxing. Crossing around the columns, he passed through the entrance, swiping an anonymous credit disc over the donation sensor. While other people peeled back their coats and shook off the rainwater, Karlendorf did the opposite, shrinking into his cover. He tapped lightly on the frame of his visor 
and let the glasses go opaque. The old soldier chided himself for leaving his hat in the ground car, but he had ordered Mirin not to drop him at the entrance for a reason. A government-issue limousine would draw the attention of the curators, and he most certainly did not wish to be recognised. Not here and now. Today, Karlendorf wanted some time to think. Some peace. The galleries displaying the history of Vega's colonization and the heritage of Old Earth were popular, as always, although the dreary weather had made attendance numbers sink. He knew the museum's layout by heart from countless visits before this one, and he took shortcuts through the side halls, staying off the main corridors. Presently, Karlendorf crossed the edge of the central atrium, where the vast hologram of Vega Six and her moons drifted overhead in stately silence, and into the Hall of the Daleks. He shied away from the sensor points where the virtual guide avatars lurked, ready to materialize in a cloud of pixels and spout pre-programmed nuggets of information. The hall was dominated by the sweep of an alien troop carrier's wingspan, the curved ship hovering silently up there on suspensers. Burn marks from particle cannon fire remained visible along the ventral surface, a mute testament to the skill of the gunnery crews who had brought the thing down over the mountains outside the capital. Beneath, an intact Dalek transolar disc platform was canted at an angle so that visitors could study it up close. He passed under the grim shadow of the troop ship without looking. Glass cabinets radiated out from the centre of the chamber, and inside each one there were various twists of wreckage or items of wartime hardware. Karlendorf saw broken-off eye stalks, luminosity discharges and cracked sensor globes alongside Space Fleet issue Mazer rifles, tattered slave tunics and replica combat uniforms. At the far end of the hall, placed at greatest distance so that anyone who entered would not be frightened by coming upon them, suddenly there were the Daleks. These did not move or become animated through holography. These were corpses, dead shells interred in glass, presented for the people so they might know the face of the great enemy. They were left alone here. Very few visitors were comfortable enough to come even within a few meters of them. The Hall of Daleks echoed with Karlendorf's footfalls and nothing else. There was a bench set away back from the front of the cabinet where he had sat each time he visited. The old warrior did so once again, letting his greatcoat come open and unfold around him in a pool of dark, heavy material. Pulling off the visor, he ran a hand over the thin stubble on his chin and saw his own reflection in the glass. A craggy old fool with the face of a street fighter and eyes that had seen a lifetime of warfare. The lines of the man he once was, the iron will of a knight of Valicia, that was still there, buried somewhere deep. But he was tired all the time now, and rest... Rest still seemed beyond his reach. He sat and stared at the killing machines, letting time become permeable and thin. He drifted away from the moment. Karlendorf let Suze come back to him, that intent look of strength in her gaze suddenly there again. He remembered Alby in his dour humour, the recollection tugging at the corner of his lips. Yes... They were all still there. Old friends faded and careworn by time. And he was still here. Unable to let go of the war. A noise made him snap back from his reverie. A party of schoolchildren, grumbling and sullen with the rain, came through the hall with a waspish tutor at their head. The archwoman had a beam pointer, and she shone it this way and that reading bits of text aloud from a data slate wherever she settled. Karlendorf listened with half an ear as she held forth, not to the actual words, but to the intention and meaning she put behind them. It tested him, but still he pressed ever so gently into her consciousness. She was cutting through the history of the Dalek War as quickly as she could, glossing over great swathes of information. The teacher's snapping discourse was keeping her pupils in line, but Karlendorf could feel the discomfort in her. She didn't want to be here at all, and not once did her eyeline cross the cabinets at the far end of the hall. 
He knew her sort. He had met them before, on too many occasions. The tutor thought the war was a terrible, horrific chapter in their history, the destructive era like a taint on the human psyche. She was trying to expunge it, to hide it away from these youngsters so they would grow up untroubled by dark memories of that time, when their grandparents were slaves to these alien dictators. In her own blinkered way, she meant well, but his jaw hardened. Had he fought for this? Had Kalndorf strode through fire and sent friends to their deaths for this? So that generations later, their sacrifices could be ignored by men and women, too afraid to learn the lessons of history? He withdrew, annoyance clouding his face. He became aware that one of the children had detached from the group and orbited closer to the case of Daleks. There was a line of light-coloured tiles set in the flooring a couple of metres beyond the cabinet, and... In the old man's experience, visitors seldom ventured across it. A sandy-haired boy no more than a dozen cycles old hovered at the line, peering through the glass at him with slow, insolent curiosity. Karlandorf saw a steady trickle of recognition forming on the lad's face. It did not surprise him. After all, the knight's portrait was just outside, over in the Hall of Chancellors. He gave the boy a hard and uncompromising stare. Get lost! He growled in a low voice and received a wide-eyed look in return. The teacher called out and the child sloped back to her side, following the party over to an enclosed hollow booth near the entrance. She ushered them inside and the tinny recording of a war documentary began to unfold. Karlandorf snorted. The tutor and her children had been in the hall proper for less than five minutes. The boy shot him a last look from the booth and vanished within. Not the most popular of attractions, is it? The old soldier's head jerked around at the new voice, and he winced at a dart of pain from his muscles. A younger man with curly shoulder-length hair and an easy smile stood near the transolar disc. Karlendorf's combat training was always with him. Even now, he registered straight away that the frock coat the man wore was completely dry, which meant he had either been in the museum for hours, or he was a member of staff. He couldn't have been the latter, they had a strict and rather bland dress code, and the former was unlikely as the doors had opened only a few moments before Karlandorf's car had arrived. He frowned. What was disconcerting to him was the fact that he hadn't been aware of the man entering the hall. I suppose not, he allowed. The new arrival sank his hands into his pockets and crossed the line of the tiles without a pause, walking languidly up to the Dalek cabinet. Right up to it. Not an arm's length away. Not even a hand's. He stood almost with his nose against the barrier, just scant inches from the unblinking eye stalk of a Type 2 Dalek drone. Karlandorf had never seen anyone do that before, not in all the years he had visited the museum. The fearlessness on the man's face was something he hadn't seen for a long time. Not since the war. They don't look like much, do they? He said quietly. Silly big pepper pots. Clumsy and awkward things. It would be hard to be afraid of them if you didn't know what they could do. Karlandorf found himself nodding, his confusion deepening. The way he talked, the tone of his voice. It was clear to the old knight that this slight, unassuming fellow knew the Daleks as well as he did. But how could that be? He wasn't old enough to have faced them in battle. His bearing was as far from that of a military man as it could be. At best, he would have been a child in the closing days of the conflict. He got a smile. Can I join you? The man indicated the bench. Karlandorf pressed down on his wandering thoughts and reasserted his usual grim bearing. I'm not looking for any companions at the moment. No, neither am I. The reply seemed a little weary. He sat anyway, ignoring Karlandorf's sour expression. I remember when I first saw them, you know. A gang of tin-pot dictators living in the ashes of a dead empire, shouting and posturing. I thought that would be the last of them. The Daleks are gone, he said the words automatically, without conscious thought. It was a knee-jerk reaction, the sort of thing that one might say to a troubled child after a nightmare. Soft grey eyes turned to him. Do you really believe that? I want to, Karlandorf tensed, suddenly feeling uncomfortable. He hadn't expected to reply so... so honestly to the stranger. It wasn't like him. 
He was a knight of Valicia, trained to be circumspect and careful in all things. There was an odd compulsion in him, a drawing out inherent in the younger man's manner. He didn't like it. We fought them and we beat them, he said more firmly. That's all they are now, all they deserve to be. He stabbed a finger at the cabinets. Relics. Monsters from the past. But people have a way of forgetting about the past. The other man nodded in the direction of the hollow booth. Don't you think? And all at once it was there. The cold touch of awareness, the battle sense that had taken Karlandorf through a thousand fights and skirmishes. The dark, animal instinct that made him the superlative soldier he was. He knows who I am. He's a potential threat. Gently, Karlandorf's hand slipped towards the laser pistol. All those thoughts of old foes back in the car, and now they were here. An assassin, he imagined, sent by any one of a dozen rivals. In his time, it hadn't just been the Daleks that the knight had brought to their knees. The Terriels, the Simbasa, the Celebi Compact. All of them still had the old man on their capture-kill lists. It wouldn't be the first time they had tried to take him. Karlandorf, please, said the man carefully spreading his hands to show he wasn't carrying any conventional weapons. I'm a friend. I've buried all my friends. He had his fingers resting on the pistol grip. I'll bury all my enemies as well. The knight studied the man and pushed. His telepathic perception flowed out and brushed across the surface of... something. something, 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 something. The new arrival smiled, letting him run the preternatural sense over his aura, like fingers sifting through sand. Karlandorf's breath caught in his throat. He had expected to touch a pebble and instead found a mountain. The man was impossibly ancient, by a magnitude the soldier found difficult to comprehend, and familiar too, but different with it. Confused, he blinked and let his psyche retreat, certain of only one thing. I know you. I'm a friend, like I said, but I'm not surprised you don't recognize me. It has been a long time since we met on Zelaria. You mean Spyroton? Karlandorf corrected automatically, the memory of the incident flooding back. But you're not him. He studied the man. On the surface, there wasn't even the first iota of similarity between the small, acerbic stranger he had encountered during the Zelarian occupation and this taller, young fellow. Except the eyes. The eyes were identical. They were full of that same alien distance, the same strange melancholy. He considered it for a moment. Perhaps it wasn't so hard to accept after all. Karlendorf had seen entire worlds ripped from existence in a heartbeat, and creatures that had emerged from parallel realities. The idea of a being who could alter his physical form so radically was not so shocking in comparison. I changed, came the reply, as if he saw the train of thought on the warrior's face. And I will again. But there are some things I have to do first. He glanced up at the silent machines. Doctor! A curious smile formed on the soldier's lips as he accepted it. Hello again. Hello, Karlendorf. How have you been? Better, he admitted. The condition of the mind was one of rage. If there had ever been a time when the state had differed, there was no memory of it available for review. This seemed to be correct. Any other condition would have a lesser value. It would be ineffectual. There were some species, insignificant and weaker species, that would have considered it impossible for a mind to sustain such a state for so long. This was ample proof of their frailty and perfect justification for their eradication. It also served to prove the superiority of the mind. It was this rich hate that allowed it to live, even when darkness and silence surrounded it. The purity of it, the utter clarity it provided, had remained unshakable when all other things had been lost. It had taken some time to reach this perfection of intent, however. That much was true. At the start, in the crippling, burning aftermath of the catastrophic silence, it had been difficult to think in an orderly fashion. Understanding had come very slowly as the new conditions of the mind's circumstances gradually revealed themselves. In those moments, as broken pieces of consciousness blinked in and out of awareness while the mind tried to repair itself, some species might have experienced emotional states such as fear. This was not what transpired. Such conditions were anathema to the mind and its like. 
They were the domain of lesser beings. Fear was something that it created, not experienced. Mechanisms for chronological determination were inactive, and so the exact measure of how much time had passed between the burning, thunderous agony of the attack and the first proper understanding of the changes was lost. Feeling out the borders of what had gone on took many rails. Energy was spent, bled out through flash-purged batteries. Nutrient stores were compromised, motive systems were completely destroyed. It was only possible for the broken, barely functional self-repair tools to operate, and only then at speeds a fraction of their normal capacity. Power trickled in drips from the external receptor plates, and the mind turned itself first to bringing every last erg from them. In time, what little remained of the casing's active sensors were reconnected. Damage was severe. Vision quadrants were impaired, magnetic, thermal, quantum, and microwave detection pallets operated far below optimal levels. Still, the mind tried to see beyond itself. At first, comprehension was elusive. It gradually concluded that it was confined, although the method of incarceration was quite poor. It was only a thin barrier of translucent fused silica, one that a single blow could shatter. However, with its manipulator refusing to answer commands and an inability to move, the point was moot. Sometimes the mind was aware that it was being observed from outside its prison, but there seemed to be no method or rationale behind the surveillance. The humanoids that watched it stayed only for short periods, and never with anything that approximated guided intent. The root of the great anger began here seeded in a moment of insight when an immature humanoid attacked the cell with a thrown piece of vegetable matter. Several others of similar age and appearance stood in front of the confinement. They emitted atonal sounds that the mind understood were directed at it. They were mocking. They were no longer afraid. But after hundreds of thousands of rails, the observers diminished almost to nothing. The mind was also aware of those trapped alongside it. Although the acuity of the optical sensor was intermittent, it perceived others of its kind through reflections on the inside of the barrier. On no occasion did the mind detect anything resembling awareness from its kindred. Attempts to generate a faint localized electromagnetic pulse in order to communicate with them were fruitless. The inevitable conclusion was that the mind was quite alone. It concluded that the casing's long-range communication system was repairable, given much time and the dedication of almost all the available energy to the task. The mind decided it would reconstruct this component and contact the rest of its kind, who had clearly been unaware of its conscious state when they abandoned it here. And then others would come, and the humanoids would be made to remember fear again. However, with the next solar day, that decision changed. The hollow booth had reached the end of its display cycle and the tutor strode out with her charges in tow. The woman dispensed data slates to each of the children and waved them off to begin their schoolwork assignments. Karlendorf saw the sandy-haired boy again, lurking at the edge of the chamber. He looked back at the doctor and considered him. Zelaria. Decades ago now, he and Susan Mendes had been there. Years later, Karlendorf came across fragmentary references to the renegade traveller, and they had stirred his interest for a time. It had even become a hobby of sorts before he tired of it, sifting through the data nets for references to a Time Lord in a rectangular travelling machine. But there was nothing a regimented, well-ordered mind like his could grasp hold of. Karlendorf's life ran on information, on facts and not hearsay. The Doctor was a transient phenomenon, and there were more pressing demands on his time. There were other wars to be fought, other enemies to be defeated. But here he was again. Decades later, changed and yet changeless. You knew we would win, didn't you, on Spyridon? Even then you knew we would find victory. I'm sorry I couldn't warn you about how things would turn out. He frowned, 
That device of yours, the blue box, so it is true that it can travel through time? Yes. Is it here, now? The doctor looked away. Kalendorf, I... Let me use it. Let me go back to whenever they were spawned and destroy them. Let me... Let me be sure, Doctor. He felt his pulse race at the thought of it. The Time Lord got up and walked away a few steps. I had that chance once, he said, spreading his palms. In my hands. The knight's lip twisted. And you hesitated, didn't you? I can see the echo of that instant in your thoughts. You weren't willing to become them in order to destroy them, yes? He stood and faced the doctor. And that was a long time ago. And as you say, you have changed. Not that much. Are you sure? He gestured around. Why are you here, doctor? Is there something you want from me? This is a strange place to look for a confessional. He was silent for a long time, as if he were trying to find a way to frame his thoughts. There's a place called San, do you know it? When the old man shook his head, the doctor turned and forced a smile. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He paused. What do I want? I want the same thing you do, Karlendorf. I want peace. But are you willing to destroy for it? The doctor shook his head suddenly. This is a mistake. I shouldn't have come here. I should go. Karlendorf moved, blocking his path as the Time Lord tried to move around the cabinet. No, not yet. You came here for a reason. He met the doctor's gaze and saw the shadow of a terrible choice lurking behind his eyes. It was a feeling he knew too well. Let me tell you the truth, Doctor. I don't want peace. I've been a soldier all my days, and I know peace is a fantasy. Conflict is part of our nature, and we'll never truly be free of it. No. What I want is to know that at least this war, he nodded at the Daleks, my war is over. Karlandorf saw the boy in front of the glass display case trying to pretend he wasn't watching them intently. He lowered his voice. These people don't know the horror of it, not in the way that you or I do, and they won't be ready if it returns. I can't go to my grave knowing that they'll be unprepared if the Daleks come back. The doctor's reply chilled him to the core. I'm not certain that it can ever be over. Through the mind's sporadic visual inputs, it detected the arrival of a humanoid male, typically appearing on a regular interval of approximately 691,200 rels. At first, with its attention solely focused on the matter of the communications repairs, it gave the male only cursory consideration. That was until a random scan program switched to the front of the mind's consciousness and dragged a classification from the fractured depths of the casing's memory banks. Karlendorf, humanoid male, tribal identifier, knight of Valicia, category, enemy of the Daleks, action, exterminate on sight. The mind drew more from the data files, learning the scope of the humanoid's crimes. This creature, this primitive, had dared to incite rebellion against its masters. The Karlendorf male's value was considerable, and the orders were clear. For a time, the mind weighed its options. Directing repairs away from the communication system to the casing's inert primary weapon would negate any possibility of recovery. It would take longer to bring the gun to combat readiness, and then longer still to gather enough power to fire it. But then there were no guarantees the communicator's signal would reach a command nexus. By human reckoning, the slow process of repair would take years, and the mind would have to work carefully and quietly, keeping the functioning of its systems to a level that the prison's monitoring devices would not be able to detect. The procedure would be long and laborious, and it would require a singular pathological application of intent. In the end, there really was no question of priorities. 
it was in the mine's power to exterminate Karlendorf. And so it would. In my thoughts, I played out this meeting with you a hundred times. Karlendorf felt the tension of the moment settling in his bones, and he returned to the bench. I imagined all sorts of dazzling, airtight logic that I could put to you that would convince you to let me erase them from history. But then I never saw you again, and I became convinced your time machine was just a fairy tale. He gave a rueful smile. But still, do you know, back when I was in my second term as Lord Chancellor, I even had a Black Projects group created to investigate the potential of temporal weapons. We were going to build a bomb to send it into the past. I wanted to find Scarrow and obliterate it before life had even formed on its surface. I know, admitted the doctor. Your people were doing quite well for a while, but it would have upset the balance of things. The knight's face creased. The project's failure had ultimately cost him his re-election. And you can't have that, can you? It's fine for you to intervene here and there, shift the flow of a small stream now and then, but to damn the whole river. Somehow, that's wrong. I've had this conversation more times than I've saved the universe, retorted the Time Lord, and no one ever really understands it. History is not binary, Karlendorf. One, zero, on, off, life, death. It doesn't work that way. What the Daleks have done, who they are and what they will do, those things have already been written on the face of the universe. In the cracks in between, we can change things, little things. His voice drifted off. At least, I used to think that was true. Karlendorf shook his head. You have the ability to exterminate the Daleks, Doctor. If what they say about you is true, you always have. There has to be another way! The burst of anger from the other man came out of nowhere, and the knight was shocked by its ferocity. Why does it all have to end in destruction, old soldier? Can you tell me that? Why does it have to be death? Once again, he sensed the icy presence there in the Doctor's mind. The ghost of a decision that dwarfed the worst judgments Karlendorf had ever had to make. And all at once, he understood why the Time Lord was here. You have a choice, Doctor. I can only discern the vaguest edges of it, the size and complexity of the moment. His hand went to his lips. Oh, I pity you. It's hollowed you out, hasn't it? Such a great, awful choice to make. That's why you came back to speak to me. Because you know I am a warrior. Because my gift allows me an insight into what you are facing. The doctor's face was pale, a faint sketch of the warm, smiling aspect he had shown on his arrival. The chance to free the universe of the Daleks. The price. The price is everything I know. The weapons had been ready for quite some time. The mind gathered in the energy to fire and kept it hidden, deep in the casing, shunting the power to the core of the battery packs where it lay out of range of the cell's detectors. There had already been a number of occasions when the target, Karlendorf, had presented himself before the cabinet but the mind understood from the humanoid's records that he was a unique quarry. He would see any motion from the gun and avoid it. So the shot had to come while the emitter barrel was static. This narrowed the attack options significantly. In addition, the performance of the casing's optical sensor array was deteriorating. Incidents of blackouts and imaging disruption were now occurring with increased regularity, and the mind estimated the total failure of the vision system was likely to occur very soon. Even now, focal depth monitoring was discontinuous. The target, Karlendorf, was visible at the edge of the optical sensor envelope, but the engagement soon was clattered by the appearance of another humanoid male. 
Automatically, the mind swept the second biped with its recognition scan. The Doctor. Gallifreyan male. Tribal identifier. Time Lord. Category Enemy of the Daleks. Action Exterminate on sight. For the briefest of moments, rage gave way to surprise. Then the fury returned tenfold. The mind had been presented with two of the most valued targets in the memory bank's inventory, both equally hated, both equally deserving. The killing urge rose, and the power flowed up and into the weapon's pre-fire chamber. The gun announced its readiness, the coiled energy for one single lethal burst of radiation ready to be unleashed. There would only be one shot, and after it was released, the mind understood that what fragmentary existence it still had would be forfeit. But it would be worth it to show that the reach of its race was unbound, that their revenge was limitless. And carefully, the Dalek made the choice of which of them to murder. It happened with horrific speed. In the periphery of his vision, Karlandorf saw the beam weapon shift to the most infinitesimal of fractions, dipping so that the grey Dalek could have a clear line of fire. In his mind, he was still the young man, still the vital and indomitable knight capable of winning wars single-handed. But time had robbed him of that reality. As fast as his nerves sent the impulses, his age-worn muscles could not match them. As swift as he was... Karlandorf was still too slow, fingers tightening on the laser, tearing the compact pistol from the folds of his greatcoat, crying out. He saw the doctor turning, throwing out his hands in a gesture of protection, shouting. Too late. Too late! The blue-white beam of coherent energy shattered the glass cabinet. The shriek of superheated air molecules crashed about the chamber, the horribly familiar sound cutting into Kallendorf's soul. He had prayed he would never hear that noise again. The boy took the shot, point-blank in the chest. For one monstrous second, his flesh flashing translucent with the killing discharge the tiny frame of his skeleton visible. The child died without a scream, falling to the marble floor. Karlendorf's pistol sprayed laser bolts up the length of the Dalek, tearing through its casing and ripping it apart. Decrepit, decayed organic components boiled away. The Dalek attempted to speak, but all that came out was a strangled, grating death rattle. Adrenaline shock flooded through the old man, and he began to tremble. It was difficult to hold the gun, but he kept his fingers tight around it. It was comforting in its own sad way. Crouching over the child, the doctor closed the sandy-haired boy's eyes and did not look up. It was still alive, after all that time. Alarms were sounding all through the building, the internal security sensors alight with the discharge from the weapons. Yes. Karlendorf cast a practiced gaze over the alien killer. He would have been inert when they found it. Must have escaped the detectors of the recovery crews. No one could have known. He nudged a shattered hemisphere with his boot. It must have been gathering energy for years through its solar collectors. The knight looked up at the tiny skylight in the roof. Hoarding every scrap of power. Waiting for the right moment. But to kill a child. The doctor's indignant anger was towering. What possible threat could he have been to it? Karlendorf studied the Dalek's eye stalk. Part of the lens was milky white. The optic sensor was badly damaged. He couldn't see him. He was... He was just in the line of fire. He looked away. A new victim in an old war. With great delicacy, the doctor gathered up the boy's body. The knight holstered his pistol and took the boy from him. This is the price, doctor, he husked, his voice thick with emotion. Every child, every being that lives, is under threat so long as the Daleks exist. 
You must make that choice, Doctor. Whatever it is, whatever it costs you. Karlandorf walked from the hall and did not look back. The tutor came running, the indelible horror shattering her thoughts. The knight felt the rough edges of them as he passed her by, as she fell to her knees and began to weep. The tidal drag of long-buried nightmares pulled at her as her children stood around in a loose halo, not understanding what had happened. The boy was light. He carried him out through the halls, out between the towering pillars of the entrance, and past the milling, panicking people. Some of them were as old as he was. Some of them had the old fear in their eyes. Yes, he wanted to tell them. The war still goes on. The soldier crossed to the base of the memorial, and the guide robots shuffled out of his way. Karlendorf knelt and lay the dead child on the broad stone plinth. He felt empty. What was the boy's name? He had nothing to hand that he could use to carve it into the stone. After a moment, he stepped back and let his gaze range up along the height of the memorial. Splashing, frantic footsteps signalled Mirin's approach behind him. Lord Chancellor! she shouted. The woman had a stub gun in her hand, panning it about in search of any aggressors. Are you all right, sir? I'm not wounded, Karlandorf replied. The museum, Mirin said breathlessly. I heard the alarms. The security scanners said a Dalek attacked you in there. He could tell she could hardly believe it. There was weapons fire and... The Dalek is dead, he spoke over her. There was only one casualty. The agent's panting slowed as she saw the boy. Oh. Her composure slipped for a moment and then returned. Duty first, just as he expected from her. But the other man. The scanners recorded a third person in the hall. He seems to have vanished. Do you know who he was, sir? Karlandorf turned his face to the rain. Someone looking for peace. Peace.